Great to see so many of you. Brave the snow. It was snowing again this morning. But it's a very tropical minus 19 today, so it's not too bad. Who tried to take their dog a walk on the day it was minus 35? Did anybody do that? I mean, like, my little guy would have stayed out all day, but I, after three minutes, I'm like, we're going back to the house. He would have stayed out there. And thankfully, tomorrow, if the weatherman has got it right for once in his life, it might even be plus one. Could you imagine that? Get the sunscreen out, the beach towels, you know. Summer is here. So, that would be a new beginning for us, weather-wise, if all the snow melted. And we are talking about new beginnings throughout this month, the month of January. Last week, we did a communion service together, and we talked about the new covenant. And today, we're going to continue talking about new beginnings, but today, we're going to be talking about a new you, a new you. Is that what it says? Yes, new beginnings in a new you. It's a little bit of a tongue. But how many of you would like to see yourself, your life, your personality, your thinking processes renewed? and revived and come alive and flourish in a new way this year. How many of you would like to be a new you this year? Okay. And how many of you would like your spouses or children to be a new you this year? Anybody? Nobody's clapping for that one because you're scared. Because <laughs> they're sitting next to you and they've got sharp elbows. So we all want God to do something fresh and new in our life. Sometimes we, are, we only think and even blessings over and above what we need into our life. No good thing will he withhold from those who love him. Okay, and so God is in the business of making sure that we are blessed and that good things come into our lives, but that's not the priority. The priority isn't new things. We will look at new things next week, but the priority to God is a new you. Sometimes we want a new life, a new lifestyle, a new set of life circumstances, but we don't want to change and grow into the kind of person who lives that life, right? Some, it, it's like, it, it, it would be like, um, you know those SpongeBob cartoons where they go to the gym and the lobsters are doing all, this, has anybody ever seen those, you know? And then there's like, a, there's little SpongeBob with his little skinny arms and legs and, and Squidworth and all of that there and they can't lift it. They want to be able to look, they want to be able to lift the weights that the lobster dudes are lifting. But they have to first become the kind of people that are capable of lifting those weights. And sometimes we want a blessed life, but a blessed life is a weighty life, okay? It brings with it responsibilities. The more businesses you own, the more responsibilities you've got. The more children you have, the more responsibilities you've got. If you're daft enough to have six pets like me, the more responsibilities you've got. Every time you get something new, more responsibility comes with it. A blessed life can be a weighty life. And if you're a spiritual weakling, you cannot carry the weight of a weighty life. So maybe before you get new stuff, maybe you need God to make you a new you. 
to make you grow into the kind of person that is mature enough, has enough wisdom, has enough life experience and so on to be able to adequately deal with the blessed life. So we're looking at you, that's a priority. And that's what God always does. I was reading a story just last week about a businessman in the UK, in the city of London, and he owned various old properties. And there was this old warehouse that he owned, and it had actually been empty for a couple of years. Nobody had been there. There were no security guards. And so, like, it had been vandalized. The doors and windows had all been broken. If you went inside the building, it was full of, like, empty cans of beer and stuff like that. People had built little fire pits in it. I mean, the place was quite a mess inside, and he hadn't seen it for a while, but another business man was was interested in buying it. So he took him to see it, and when the man who owned it got there, he was a little bit embarrassed about the state of it all, and he said to this guy, if you agree to the deal, we will make sure someone comes in and takes away everything that's broken, the broken doors and the broken window frames and and things like that, and, and we'll try and patch it up and so on. And the other man said, no, I don't want you to do any of that. I want that building just the way it is. But I'm not going to leave it just the way it is. What we're going to do is we are going to dismantle it, every part of it. We're going to dismantle the frames. And this this was a Victorian building. And so, you know, like today we build a factory and it just looks like a big cardboard box. In fact, today we build a supermarket and it just looks like a big cardboard box, right? Right? In the past, they seem to have more taste than we do today. Have you ever noticed that with architecture? Even factories were intricately designed with, with, uh, with great carvings and all kinds of things, sandstone buildings. And so he said, we are going to completely dismantle it. We are going to take every piece that has been used, clean it up, fix it, and restore it, and then we're going to use all the parts of this building to rebuild something brand new that still contains all the original pieces, but all the original pieces fixed, repaired, and cleaned. And so that was what they did. That was the deal that took place. And when I read that story, I thought, does that not sound like what God does to us? When you come to Christ, you are dirty with your own sins. You are damaged and broken because other people have spray painted you and left their old beer cans there and mistreated you. You have got wounds and hearts that need to be repaired. You have sins and dirt that needs to be washed away. And you would think that that God could just kind of like blow you up and kill you and then make a brand new you. God does make a brand new you, but it's not that he makes a new you. It's that he makes you new. He takes the old you, he doesn't, it's not like he, oh, this one's gone wrong, let's clone him and then euthanize this one and we'll stick with the good one. That's not what God does, right? He says, this one's broken, let's take it apart completely. Let's clean everything that's contaminated. Let's mend everything that's broken. And then let's take the same parts the same life journey, the same mind, the same spirit, the same experiences from life, but let's put them back together in a new way that is strong and is solid and is not an an old fact, empty factory that people can use and abuse, but is now the temple of the Holy Spirit that the presence of God himself will dwell in. God, when he makes a new you, What he does is he takes the old you and makes it new, renews it. Look what it says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It says that God makes us a new 
creation. It says anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new creation. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. Now, you might think to yourself, yeah, 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 that's all good and well. I did become a new creation 24 years ago, but I have messed up many times since then. Well, I've got some good news for you this morning. This was not written in English. It was written in Greek. And many languages have emphases and tenses and things like that. You know, a lot of languages have gender in it, male or female gender. Certain words are, you know, Spanish, for instance, is like that. And a lot of languages have tenses that you can't really translate. And in Greek, anyone who belongs to Christ is a new creation. In English, that could mean 20 years ago you were made a new creation. But in Greek, it has the feeling of it's always new. At any moment, it's new. Every time you go back and open that passage, it's still there. You're new again. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, it says in the book of Lamentations. His mercies never end. They are new every morning. God, listen, you might have blown it yesterday, but that newness is available to you today. The old things from yesterday have passed away. Behold, today, it's all brand new. His mercies are new every morning. You become a new creation. The, the old life is gone. A new life has begun. And all of this is a gift. It's not something you have to earn. You don't have to go to school and pass an exam to do it. It's a free gift from God. All of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ and has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ. You know, when Jesus died on the cross, remember when he died on the cross? Remember he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Remember that thing? Well, it's a really deep thing. We could spend a lot of time going into it, but it's a totally different message. But even if we just take those words at face value, God did not forsake Jesus on the cross. Jesus may have experienced our God forsakenness the same way as Jesus never sinned, and he wasn't sinful, but he experienced and took upon himself our sins. But even when he was experiencing that and saying that, this says God was in Christ, reconciling the world. You might feel like God has forsaken you. You might not have felt his presence for a long time, but even while you're feeling those emotions, God is still dwelling within you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Trust God. Don't trust your emotions. Your emotions come and go, but God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting up people's sins, no longer saying, well, you're not getting in because of this, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us, we speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. So if you, 
if your trust is in the Lord, if you're walking with the Lord, maybe you're going through good times, maybe you're going through bad times. Maybe emotionally you feel high, maybe emotionally you feel low. But either way, if you are walking with the Lord, you can trust him. He has made you a new creation. That newness is fresh every day and every moment. His mercies are new every morning. And that everything in the past, even up until five minutes before you walked in this door, everything in the past is gone and God is opening up a new future to you. You can trust in that. But if you don't know for sure that you have put your faith in Christ, if you don't know for sure that you are walking with the Lord, maybe you have never actually We sang, I surrender. Maybe you've never surrendered your life into the hands of Jesus Christ. Or maybe you're unsure whether you have. You did it once and you've kind of strayed away or something like that. Well, today is the day for you to have a new beginning. That last verse says, come back to God. Everybody say that with me. Come back to God. And so you just need to come back. Come back into the family. Come back to the Father's house. Come back into a place of trust in God. And take him at his word that he makes everything new in your life. He washes away the old filth. He mends the old brokenness. And he sets your feet on the right path. If anyone belongs to Christ, you are a new creation. Now, when you become a new creation, when you come to Christ and everything feels new and you're just learning and so on, one of the things you may notice is not every part of you becomes new. You know, your heart, your spirit comes alive. But thankfully, your body doesn't go back to being a wee tiny baby again, you know? It's not like you're born again and now you've got a little baby body. Like... Benjamin Button or something like that, you know? So you have the same body that you had before. Now, we, we, nobody thinks much about that, but have you ever noticed that you also have the same mind that you had before? And although your heart has come alive and it wants to go in this direction, your mind's still full of a lot of silly junk ideas, And so not only do we need to be made a new creation, but our personality needs to be renewed as well. Our thinking, our emotions, and so on. And so the next slide, if we go to the next one, it talks about a renewed personality. Everyone say that with me. A renewed personality. Not a new, again, not a new personality. It's not like, Um, what kind of personality have you got? Depending, you know, whether it's Myers-Briggs or whatever, let's say it's the disc one. I'm an I, I'm a high I. Well, we're going to rip that up now. You're going to be a C from that. It's not, it's not like that. It's not like your old personality gets thrown. God likes your personality, okay? In fact, Some Christians are really boring and don't seem to have much of a personality. Have you ever noticed that? You are allowed to have a personality. You're even allowed to express it. Okay? I know that's not Canadian, but it's kingdom. Okay? You can express it. Now look, a renewed personality, Ephesians 4. With the Lord's authority, I say, live no longer as unbelievers do for they are hopelessly confused. If you don't believe that, go on social media. They're hopelessly confused. Unbelievers are hopelessly confused. They don't know the difference between right and wrong. They don't know the difference between male and female. They don't know the difference between freedom and slavery. Sometimes I think We are living in like a dystopian novel where new speak is where love means hate and war means peace. And it's like every people use words and you read them and you think, I know all those words, but I don't think any of them mean what you think they mean, you know? 
Now if someone comes up and says, do you like my new, do you like my new blue sweater? Uh, no, I don't think you suit that. You're a hater. You're a hater. We're going to cancel you. You're a racist. You're a ra- it's a blue sweater. They're all at it. All the, un- the politicians, all the unbelievers are at it. They are hopelessly confused. Okay? Do you know what really upsets me at times? Much of the body of Christ get caught up with all the issues of the world and we end up hopelessly confused as well. Whereas before that, we were clear, we were sound-minded, our feet were on a rock and we know the direction the Lord is leading us in. So it's saying here, no longer live like unbelievers. They're hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. But that isn't what you learned about Christ. Let's go on. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old nature and your old form of life. It's like you've got an old coat on. It's ripped. It's got moth holes in it. Moths have been eating it. It lets the minus 35 degrees weather in. You're cold. You're freezing. But it's familiar you like it, but nobody else likes it. It's filthy and it stinks. But we want to keep it on because that way we will fit in with all the other filthy, stinky people in the world and we won't stand out and then we won't be persecuted or ridiculed or anything. But you know what this says? Take that old garment off and throw it away. Like Lazarus, when Jesus said to the, to, when the tomb was open and Jesus spoke to the dead body, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus got up, but the Bible says he was still bound with the grave clothes and he kind of shuffled out. And then the next thing Jesus said was, loose him and let him go. Take all that. Jesus doesn't just want to forgive your sins, give you eternal life, and so you know you're going to heaven when you die. He doesn't just want to give you new life. He wants all the old grave clothes to come off, all the old bad attitudes, the wrong way of thinking. Look, throw off that old former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit continually, not a one-time thing, but continually renew. Renew what? Renew your thoughts and attitudes. Get your new coat, your new nature, and put it on. Begin to open up to the, to the Lord so that by His Spirit, He will renew your personality, your thoughts and your attitudes, the two things that drive the course of your life, God can renew them and he can make you a new personality, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. And do not grieve God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. I know we go out there and you can go to West Ed Mall and you can walk about with everyone and you can't tell by sight who the believers are and who the unbelievers are. And even if you came into a church and you look around, you can't tell by sight who truly has put their faith in Christ and who's just going through the religious motions. You don't know that, but God knows that. He, he looks out and he can say, That one there's mine, that one's mine, that one's mine. I have put my spirit upon you to if God's spirit dwells within you, that is God identifying, you're one of mine and you're gonna be saved on the day of redemption. You're coming 
into my presence. And so I want you to live free now. Let your personality, let your thoughts and your attitudes be renewed by the Holy Spirit. And then the third one is this. My third point is this, a restored life. See that with me, everyone. A restored life. So I said a little bit earlier, put your trust in God and in his word. Don't put your trust in your emotions because they are changeable and they come and go. However, I do acknowledge that there can be times when something has happened in your life, maybe something has happened to you, or maybe you made some blunder and did something, and whatever it was, the impact of it on your life is so big that you feel you cannot get out of that. You can't shake it. You, you can't get restored back to where you were before. Well, you know, last year, towards the end of last year, at Gateway Academy, um, which, by the way, will be getting launched again soon in a, in a few weeks' time. So you want to look into that, gateway.ac slash academy, and you will see what our winter semester is going to be all about. But in the last one, in the fall semester last year, one night, one night I was talking about this passage of Scripture, and two or three people spoke to me afterwards and said, wow, that really spoke to me. You need to share that on a Sunday sometime. Now, usually I just say, oh yes, thank you, don't think about it, but something about it stuck with me. And as I was praying about this new beginnings, it kept coming back and I want to share it with you. It's a really important story about how God can take a failure and make them a success, about how God can take someone who's blown it and he can restore them and make them a leader amongst their peers, about how someone who has lost all of their, their courage, all of their motivation, um, all of their enthusiasm, and now feels flat and feels abandoned, God can make them better than they ever were before. This is the story of Peter. And before we start reading it, I just want to remind you of two major events that happened in Peter's life. The first one was this. Peter was a fisherman. He was just like a blue-collar guy. He came from Galilee. The people in Judea thought the people in Galilee were rednecks. And so they would just have said, he's just some redneck dude that's a laborer and has got this business where he fishes and so on. Nobody would have thought there was anything different than, about him than all the other guys that are there. And one day he's fishing in his boat and this new hot shot rabbi that he's heard about, Jesus, comes by. And Peter, who owns uh, a couple of fishing boats, he has this business and he's got brothers that work with him and he's got some employees that work with him and they have been working on this fishing boat all night and they caught nothing. They're really discouraged. They've got no money. They've got no income for the day. They're pulling their nets back on shore, uh, back onto the boat. And on the shore, Jesus is there and he shouts, hey guys, have you caught anything? And they said, no, we've not. And Jesus says, throw your nets on the other side of the boat and you'll get a catch. And you can imagine Peter and the rest of them, it's like, we're fishermen, we know this sea, we know where the fish are, we know there's no fish there, you're a rabbi, you're a book-learned boy, you know, what do you know about fish? And, um, but he says, we've worked all night and there's no fish, nevertheless, at your word, Lord, we will do it. And he casts his net out and they get a miraculous catch of fish and he's overwhelmed and he knows it's a miracle, and he's so impacted by this miracle, he falls on his knees and he says to Jesus, depart from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. When you get a glimpse of God, the first thing you realize is how inadequate you are, right? Happened to Isaiah, happens to everybody. Depart from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. And Jesus said to him, come, follow me, 
and I will give you a new job. Not catching fish, but catching people for the kingdom of God. And Peter's whole life changed that day. He left his old life and he became a follower of Jesus. But fast forward three and a half years and Jesus is being arrested. He's just been betrayed by Judas Iscariot. The guards have come. They've arrested Jesus. The disciples have ran away, including Peter. He's now ran away after saying to Jesus, when Jesus prophesied and said, you will deny me three times. Oh Lord, I will never, I'll die with you. I will never deny you. And then just hours later, Peter denies the Lord three times. And it's not even a scary Roman centurion that he denies the Lord to. It's a servant girl. He's it's nighttime and there's a charcoal fire there and he is standing around the fire keeping warm and there's a servant girl around the fire keeping warm and she says, you're one of his disciples. And three times, including using swear words, he denies that he even knows Jesus. And just as he does it the third time, Jesus is brought out by the guards and looks at him eye to eye and a cock crows just like Jesus predicted. Can you imagine the sense of failure that Peter now has compared to the sense of elation when he realized this rabbi is the Messiah and he wants me, a sinful man, to be his follower and to, to take on a whole new role in the kingdom. And now I've blown it, I've betrayed him, I'm not worthy, I'm filthy, I'm dirty. So after Jesus rises from the dead, even though Jesus has appeared to them, Peter still feels dejected. He still feels like, okay, he has risen from the dead, but I blew it. I can't do anything now. And he says, what all guys say when they're depressed, let's go fishing. <laughs> so they all go fishing and they toil all night and catch nothing. Peter must be thinking, oh, this is familiar. Yeah, I remember when the Lord called me and it was wonderful and this happened and then I blew it. And on the shore, the disciples went out to the boat to fish, but they caught nothing all night. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who it was. And he called out, fellows, have you caught any fish? No, they replied, then Jesus said, throw out your net on the right-hand side of the boat. This is like an action replay. There's a feeling of deja vu happening here for Peter. And they throw the net and you'll get some. So they did. And they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. Then the disciple Jesus loved, that's an old-fashioned way of saying Jesus BFF, which was John, said to Peter, it's the Lord. Because they knew that the only person who could do this is Jesus. It's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, he put on his tunic, for he had stripped for work, jumped into the water and headed to the shore. Let's read on. The other stayed with the bow and pulled the loaded net to the shore for they were only about 100 yards from shore. When they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them. Fish cooking over doo -doo 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 -doo. a charcoal fire. Deja vu, number two. Peter has just been reminded of his initial call from Jesus and the great euphoric events that took his life in one direction. And now he is being reminded of the abysmal and terrible failure he made of everything and how he's no longer worthy to fulfill that call. A charcoal fire and some bread. Bring some of the fish you just caught, Jesus said. So Simon Peter went aboard and dragged the net to the shore 
And somebody took the time to count these. I think it was Andrew. If, and it says, there were 153 large fish, and yet the net hadn't torn. Let's read on. Now come and have some breakfast, Jesus said. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Have you ever had that experience where out of the blue something happens and it's like, oh my goodness, this new opportunity has come to me. This new decision has come my way. And you know it's the Lord, but it came out of the blue and you, and you have to process it. This is what they're going through. They knew it was the Lord. Then Jesus served them the bread and the fish. This was the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples. Why is that important? How many times did Peter deny the Lord? Let's read on. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know I love you. Then feed my lambs. Jesus told him, Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. That you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Do you remember that uh, Peter was asked standing one night around a charcoal fire three times? Are you not one of his disciples? And three times Peter denied that he even knew Jesus. Jesus is giving Peter a do-over right now. Jesus is giving you a do-over at the beginning of this year. Whatever things you've done that have blown it in the past year, God is giving you the chance for a reset. Not the great reset, but the divine reset. And there's going to be a reset in your life where you can start afresh Three times he denied Jesus around a charcoal fire one night, and three times he has given the opportunity to undo that and to affirm to Jesus, yes, Lord, I love you. You know I love you. And just like Jesus gave him the initial call, come and be a fisher of men, he is now reinstating his call, come and be a shepherd, not of sheep, but of people of God's flock. Come and be a shepherd of people. He, Jesus reestablishes Peter once again. And Peter doesn't even need to pretend he's got it all together. God's not asking you to pretend, oh Lord, if I will follow you and I will never depart from you, because that was what Peter, I will never deny you. And then he did, right? All God wants you to do is to be totally honest with him. I'm going to show you something in this slide that we do not see in the English, but you see it in the Greek. Two different words for lover used here. Two different words. So there is a word phileo, which is where you get Philadelphia from. You know, Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. So there's a kind of love that is like brotherly love, friendship love, right? And then there's another word for love, agape or agape, agape love. And it means, the best translation would maybe be like unconditional love. That's the love that God has for us. God has agape love. He has this unconditional love or this love that goes beyond how you're feeling. And this is what happens. Jesus says to Peter, Peter, do you love me with unconditional love? And Peter says, Lord, you know I failed you. I do love you, but it's human love. It's brotherly love I have for you. And then Jesus says, feed my sheep. And then again, the second time Jesus says, Peter, do you love me with divine, unconditional love? He says, Lord, 
you know I love you, but you know my love is not as strong as it should be. It's brotherly love. It's friendship love. I denied you. It wasn't unconditional. And then the third time Jesus says, Peter, do you love me with brotherly love? Do you love me as a brother? Jesus is saying, I know that humans can't come up to God's level. So God came down to man's level. Peter, I will take you just as you are. I won't wait till you're perfect. I won't wait till you've got perfect love for me. I will take you just as you are. Do you love me as a brother? Yes, Lord, you know everything. You know I do. I am reinstating you once again to your position. All God wants is for you to be honest and say, Lord, I do love you. I don't love you the way I should. I don't serve you the way I should. I don't live the way I should. I want to, but I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. And God will come in and take you just as you are and then rebuild you into what you are meant to be. Let's read our last slide. It says, I tell you the truth, Peter, when you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to let him know by what kind of death he would glorify God. Then Jesus told him, the same thing that he told him three and a half years earlier with the miraculous catch of fish, come follow me. Church, people watching online, at the beginning of 2022, you may feel flat. You may feel empty. You may feel God's presence is far away from you. You may feel like things haven't gone your way. You may feel like you've blown it. You've sinned. You're no longer worthy or able to do the things that you once wanted to do. But right now, God is taking you. He makes us a new creation. When we open up to him, he renews our personality and transforms our thoughts and our attitudes and then everything in our past that God has done in our life but has fallen away, he can restore it again. And everything that we've done in our life which is wrong or shameful or unhelpful or unhealthy, he can take us just the way we are and he can clean us up, he can fix us up, he can put us back together, he can put our feet on the right path, he will take us by the hand, he will drag us along the path if we need to. You know the old, I saw this meme and it was the, you know the, po the poem that, um, uh, what's it called, Footprints in the Sand, you know that? that one, but somebody had written some new lines and it was, Jesus, what are those two big tracks there? That's where I dragged you kicking and screaming against your will. <laughs> But you know, sometimes it's not what we want, but God has a plan for our life. And all he is saying is, you don't know everything the future holds in store, but follow me, trust me. I have the best of your interest at heart. Everything I want for your life is for God's ultimate glory and for your ultimate good. So follow me and let me make all things new. Here's the last point I want to make, and it's this. God has a fresh start for you. Let's say that together. God has a fresh start for you. Let's stand together. We're going to pray and we're going to ask for God's Spirit to fill us afresh and to do whatever work needs to be done in our lives. If you have never put your faith in Christ, as we pray, you can open up your heart and put your faith in Christ and you will become a new creation. Oh, the old life will be gone and a new life will begin. If you are a believer in Jesus, but you know that your thoughts are plagued with negative thinking, your attitudes have been shaped by life's, it, life's circumstances, we're gonna ask for the Holy Spirit to renew our personalities. And if you've blown it, 
or you feel like God has abandoned you or something like that, we're going to pray now for God to give you a do-over, a fresh start, a new beginning, for him to repair everything that is wrong and to reestablish everything that's right. Let's put our, our hands to God and close our eyes, open our minds and hearts, focus on the presence of the Holy Spirit who is here with us today. And let's say together, Father God, I place my life into your hands. Take my past. Forgive me of all my sins and begin to heal and restore all of my wounds. I give you my present. I ask you to move upon me, transforming me right here and right now. I trust you with my future. I will follow you wherever you lead. I know you will lead me into your plans. And I trust you that you will bring me safely home and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Take my past, present, and future, my spirit, mind, and body, my hopes and dreams, my fears and mistakes, make me into a beautiful masterpiece. In Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said, Amen. let's give God a praise, church. Come on. Thank mm -hmm. you.